Greetings. I am Q, solving the case of the writer with no hands. This case is particularly difficult because of the widespread media attention, documentary, and focus on him being in cahoots, so to speak, with the CIA. Back in 1997, Gary DeVore, a screenwriter, was in Santa Fe, New Mexico for a week working on a script with Marsha Mason, an actress from Goodbye Girl. He finished the first draft of the script and was driving home to his wife in Santa Barbara, California. It was about 12.40 in the morning when he called his wife to check in and let her know where he was and when he'd get home. That he had the first draft of his script finished, that it was on his laptop, he was going to deliver it to the movie producers, and it was going to be a huge deal. She claims that she was watching an HBO show that she enjoyed and that she didn't want him interrupting her. So she told him to call back at around 1 a.m. He agreed and told her he would speak to her then. Strangely, he never called back. She called him after 1 a.m., but he never picked up. She began to worry, so she continued calling for another 10 minutes, but no one picked up the phone. At around 1.15 a.m., Gary called back, only this time from an unidentified number. He asked her if it had been her that was calling him. She responded by saying yes. Who else would be calling you this late at night? Gary Rowe will be starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, Billy Crystal, Jimmy Smits, Gregory Hines, Peter Strauss, John Goodman, Gary Cole, Sally Fields, Tommy Lee Jones, Christopher Walken, Priscilla Barnes, and more. Gary DeVore was a close friend of Arnold's. He was also Tommy Lee Jones' best man at his wedding, and he was Janet Jackson's ex-boyfriend. He and Wendy had been married for almost five years at this point. She asked him where he was, and he was vague. Somewhere past Barstow, he said. He was usually very precise when he told her where he was. Some other parts of the conversation made her concern, and so she asked him if he was tired, and he said he was running on adrenaline, which struck her as odd, too. He told her not to wait up for him, but she said that she would open the gate there around 4.30 a.m. for him. After this, they just said goodbye and left the conversation at that. It struck his wife as odd, as this was the first call in which he had never said, I love you, before hanging out. She also says that he was quite a talkative person, but this call was short and vague, to say the least, so it seemed out of character for him. After a week of radio silence and never returning home, his wife began to worry. Shortly after his disappearance, several people from government factions came and erased all the data that he had from his movie, as well as the script for the film. After a year of nothing, his body was found in the L.A. aqueduct with his laptop script and hands missing. His wife had stated that he was not depressed and that their marriage was fine. She also stated that he was excited because his new script was going to blow a huge CIA scandal open. Police traced his cell phone and it pinged off all the towers through his route and his initial call to her was in the records too. He was on Highway 14, south of Mojave, so were her calls to his phone on the records, but not the one when he called back. In fact, around 1am his phone stopped registering or just stopped moving. It's a little unclear. His wife says the police investigation did not find any evidence he crashed off the bridge above the aqueduct. There was no damage to the bridge, no skid marks, etc. She said, He was not tired, he was wide awake, and he was letting me know something was wrong. I think someone was with him in the car at 115. The devil, perhaps, lies in the details of the script. He was writing a remake of the film, The Big Steel, a 1949 movie about a man that organizes his own disappearance. He was setting his rewrite against the U.S. invasion of Panama to overthrow Noriega. There are reports that in doing his research for the script, he learned about the U.S. laundering money in Panama and covering it up, and other things that were disturbing. So, there were suspicions that the CIA had killed him. He was driving home to deliver the script he finished, which now revealed the real reason the U.S. invaded Panama. He had told friends the film showed some disturbing details about the U.S. invasion of Panama. It tells the story of American operatives robbing a Panamanian bank to cover up for something much more serious. One line in the movie was, It sounds like the Pentagon planned the bank robbery and the war was just a diversion. Among his research included an article claiming Noriega had compiled sex tapes of U.S. officials, Noriega would invite U.S. diplomats and officials to his home, provide them with alcohol, drugs, attractive men and women, then film it all. His wife Wendy said he would get calls from CIA officials all the time, but in the month before he died, he got a whole lot of them. She said, when we first married, he told me he got a lot of calls from government agencies. He told me to ignore it, so I did. If the phone rang, I could take a message or say he was out, but not to speak to them, really. We had a few at first, then not very many. Then, in the last month, one man was calling all the time. 
Early autopsy reports said there were no major bone breaks, no skull fractures, neck bones weren't hacked, etc. He was also a strong swimmer, swam in the ocean every day, so he could swim his way out of the river if he was conscious. It also gets a lot weirder after that. As I said, his hands were not attached to his body, but hands were found in the car with him. Hands that, according to the medical examiner, were over 200 years old. Another strange coincidence is that the CIA has confirmed that DeVore was working for them. He apparently would travel to Panama with them many times. White House officials confirmed these claims and that they were being investigated by the FBI. Another note, White House officials also claim that this has all the hallmarks of a cover-up. This cannot be confirmed, however. Now, as I said, the devil for this case is in the details of the script. The whole crux of this pivots on that one little idea of a man organizing his own disappearance. This is not possibly a coincidence. Here's what the evidence leads me to believe. This man was clearly under a lot of pressure, as all government whistleblowers are. I can imagine that once the CIA found out the details of the script, the death threats started coming in. His wife had said that they had always received calls from the CIA, but in the last month they increased in frequency. Well, his wife had said he wasn't depressed and that he was excited for this new script. I believe that the pressure had started building once he started working on the script. With pressure comes cracks. From the looks of it, Devor was clearly distressed on the phone with his wife during that conversation they had shortly before his disappearance. His wife claims that she thought someone was in the car with him during these last phone calls. But I believe the only person with Devor was his conscience and his growing fear. The CIA has been known to use tactics to destroy people's minds as well as their bodies. Fearing this and the charge of treason that might be brought onto himself, I believe that Devor faked his own death. As stated, the car showed no signs of pressing off the bridge, the body was only identified using dental records, and the movie which he was researching must have included details about faking his own death. So the truth of the matter is, fearing the CIA, he organized his own death, deploying the airbags of his car and he planted a body in it. Dental records can be easily tampered with, and, possibly with the help of the CIA, disappearance is a true possibility. Perhaps even in Panama. I do not believe 100% the CIA was involved, but I do believe that he made himself disappear. Everything connects in a neat little line. Case closed. Thanks for watching.